have to deal with all of that. And I tried to show them that how they were parents, each in very particular ways, coming from very particular contexts. And it had never occurred to them that perhaps the reason that their group in D.C. was all white has something to do with racism. And of course, people want to think that if they're nice, then they are racism free. <laughs> well, maybe they need to look more closely at exactly what racism is and how it can manifest itself systemically in institutions. The same holds true for men working with women. If women's issues are truly important to us as men, then we will go and find out about them. I never tire of saying this because we need to educate ourselves and not put women in the position of educating us. We will join in the struggle against rape and sexual harassment, against crimes of violence committed against women. We will see how the struggle for women's reproductive rights and their right to control their own bodies is connected to our struggles as queer men. We will make women and HIV a central issue in our agenda because four million women worldwide, four million, are expected to die of AIDS-related complications by the year 2000. Four million women dead by the year 2000. We will learn about difficulties in access to health care for women, the politics of breast cancer, about ovarian cancer, about the feminization of poverty, because we want to know about these and other aspects of women's lives. This is the place from which real solidarity must begin. It's not enough to say that we've done our work on our sexism and we're not sexist like other men, because if that is true, why is it that so much of life is still male-dominated? Why is it that in most groups, even in many queer groups, men dominate? Why can we not accept the leadership of women, a leadership of women of color, in real and not token ways? And we have to look at ways in which we still hold on to our male privilege. Because even if we are queer males, we still have male privilege. How do we learn to let go of that privilege? What are ways in which we, for example, in a predominantly queer male group, agitate for the inclusion of women's issues? How many of us are really honestly willing to call men on their sexist remarks or sexist behavior? How many of us are willing to point out the invisibility and silence of women in our groups? or that many of our brothers simply refuse to and cannot and will not work with women. More importantly, how many of us even notice that that is a problem? Do we remain silent accomplices of the seemingly never-ending war against women, even when we know that the very homophobia that oppresses us is rooted in the fear and hatred of women and the fear and hatred of the power of the erotic? Now, the queer community has, in many ways, in my eyes, forgotten its origins, forgotten our roots. Our present community was born out of the Stonewall Rebellion and uprising, street guerrilla warfare, not a tea dance, not a happy hour. <laughs> a rebellion led by queer women and queers of color, drag queens, Bulldogs, many of whom are the very people that our community now marginalizes because they get in the way of assimilating into the dominating culture. But who decided that assimilation into an oppressive, heteropatriarchal culture was what we wanted? This push towards assimilation makes, and you can look at all of our publications, it's so clear, makes us say that we're just like everybody else. Well, I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be straight. I don't want to be tolerated or accepted. I don't want to be in the military. <laughs> I want to ask why an imperialistic, capitalist, international police force military still exists. I don't want to be part of a military industrial complex, but I do want to know why, if this country 
the military still appears to be the only option for many poor queers, for many rural queers, for many people of color queers. Why have there never been any creative alternative? We must stop organizing as though we were straight, as though we wanted to be straight. We must stop being apologetic and so damn accommodating. Does the heterocracy ever accommodate us? I want to live my life as I choose and define myself and not be defined by others. The fear of the power of the erotic, erotophobia, in a society that is rooted in the policing of desire and the controlling of women's bodies for profit has begun to make queers censor other queers about being too sexual, about their forms of sexuality as being too transgressive. Bisexuals face biphobia within the queer community. Some people find bisexuals embarrassment just because the word sexual is in the name. <laughs> we are also a threat to a monosexualist paradigm that says that you have to be either straight or gay. And this is the same kind of thinking that has led us in this country to creating a binary construction of race. You're either black or you are white. If you are anything else, you are other. You are forced to choose with which of the categories you want to identify. But this is not a choice that we should be forced to make. The whole area is so problematic for us today because we have based so much of our struggle for queer civil rights on the argument that we can't help ourselves, we were born this way. Perhaps in addition to this argument, we must, precisely out of our context as queers, challenge the way in which this country seems to think about who qualifies for having their rights assured and protected. Bisexuals, just like multiracial people, are here to stay and aren't going anywhere. And just as bisexuals are accused of having heterosexual privilege and the ability to pass, so multiracial people are said to be able to assimilate to white culture. But what about those people who don't use that privilege? What about those people who do everything in their power to make sure that they are consistently and publicly always identified as queer? I'm a queer identified bisexual whose place is in the queer planet. And paradoxically, in my community, I am more often the object of homo hatred than a lot of the closeted gay men I know. Now, the transgender community and the leather community are also marginalized within the queer world because they too stand in the way of joining the great white heterosexual host. The transgender community, in particular, fucks with people's notions of gender, makes them very uncomfortable, and especially men, because of the effeminophobia that exists amongst queer men. You know, you better switch it up. <laughs> so we have reproduced all of the patterns of oppression of the dominating culture. If the religious right focuses on transgender people and leather people in their videos, then we run to answer them by saying, well, those people should not be allowed to be visible in our public manifestations as they ruin our reputation. We buy into the erotophobia of the religious right, and we say that bisexual, transgender, and other people are just too blatantly sexual. Instead of challenging erotophobia, we capitulate to it. And in that moment, we have let ourselves be defined by homophobic erotophobes. Where is our self-definition? Where is our self-determination? And how can I tell my transgender and leather sisters and brothers to be invisible? Who am I to tell them to be silent? How can I tell myself to be invisible and silent? If we are not community to each other, then who will be? Are we so full of self-hatred and internalized homophobia that we can only see each other as traitors in our midst. And while we are processing and working through our issues, the religious right lumps us all together while we squabble about who really belongs. We need all of the community we can get. You see, the Lesbian Gay 
aristocracy has been lulled into a false sense of security and offers really no longer any reactionary response. And this makes it particularly difficult for us to organize now against the right, especially when some people feel that there's no real problem. People say, at least he, meaning Bill, talks about us. Well, damn it, with all the taxes that I pay, I want more than just at least <laughs> he talks about us. <laughs> the military decision passed without any highly visible, very vocal protest on our part. We must not believe that because Hillary, no matter how fabulous you might think her health reform policy or her hairdo are, because she and Bill are in the White House that all is well with the world. The HIV ban on immigration, the Lani Guinier debacle, the upholding of the military ban, the war in Somalia, these are just a few things that should help us to see a bit more critically. We cannot help but stress that issues do not emerge in isolation within the movement. And some of us have focused almost exclusively, almost exclusively on so-called gay civil rights and not looked at other places of oppression. Erotophobia and racism intersect in the investment of people of color as the exotic and erotic other. People who are seen as the very incarnations of the erotic incarnation of libido, and therefore of evil, like women, to be dominated, like the earth, to be dominated, because inferior and dangerous. Just as desire is to be policed, and women's bodies are to be controlled by men, so are people of color and the environment. And this erotophobia is killing us because it keeps us from talking about safer sex in terms that are unmistakably clear keeps us from distributing condoms and dental dams, leads us to exclusively advocate abstinence, tells people with HIV that they should not have sex anymore, yet at the same time, the marketing industry makes money using sex to sell everything from underwear to whiskey. And we queers are not the ones that put those images out there. I started out by talking about Sojourner Truth as icon, and we know that for Sojourner Truth, spiritual anarchist and womanist that she was, her issues as a woman of African descent and her issues as a woman were not seen in contradiction. They were inextricably bound up together. And we can do workshop after workshop about interconnectedness of oppression, solidarity, coalition building, but we must be able not only to understand this with our heads, but in our hearts. People ask me why I should be concerned about Tibet, or why I am concerned about the plight of Ethiopian Jews, or about any people who are oppressed. As long as they are oppressed, I am oppressed. When Sojourner Truth delivered the Ain't I Woman speech, what she had to say about ending the oppression of women was not at the expense of ending the oppression of black people. For her, the two were inseparable just as they were inseparable in her very person. Many of us are familiar with the phrase, never again, me be there, in response to the Holocaust. And saying never again now means that we think of other peoples or other groups who are alienated and marginalized and oppressed, and we say with them, never again. Never again means that I stand in solidarity with all peoples who are exterminated because of their difference or their perceived otherness. Never again means that I struggle alongside all of those who, who are systematically excluded for whatever reason. Never again means that I stand in solidarity with the victims of neo-Nazism in Germany and in the United States. Never again means seeing how the struggle against racism is the struggle against classism, is the struggle against sexism, is the struggle against homo-hatred, is the struggle against ableism. And I am sure that if Sojourner Truth were here today, we would hear her say, and ain't I a Jew, and ain't I a lesbian, and ain't I a Palestinian, and ain't I a Bosnian, and ain't I an inner city dweller, and ain't I a poor farmer, and ain't I a person living with AIDS? 
And ain't I a homeless person? And ain't I a deaf person? And ain't I a Haitian? And ain't I a Hopi? And ain't I a woman? And she would be there at every march with us. She would be there doing civil disobedience and getting arrested. And she would be there challenging us constantly to be bolder freedom fighters. And she would be there being happy and not worry about what anybody thought about her. Sojourner Truth calls us to see how we can make coalition, how we can grow together, not just for fighting the right, but a growing together that is for liberation, for justice, for truth, for peace, for equality, and for just plain old fun. And when it's all over, when it's all over, I just hope, I just hope that we can sing the words of Sojourner Truth, I ain't going to die, honey. I'm going home like a shooting star. Thank you. Choosing to use it 
it empowers us. And then for a very practical reason, because um, it spares me having to say, let me give us a shot to No, I was referring, to, I was talking about film, okay, I was, in, I was talking about film, and I was talking about how white gay men's relationships are portrayed in film. I knew someone was going to come for me on that one, so. There is a term, and I cannot remember our, our um, the, it's, it's a word that is used that um, encompassed homosexual and lesbian. Do you know what that word is? And I know, I can't remember, because usually when people are thinking about homosexuals, um, now people are understanding, or people, it will include less, the, the, the word lesbian in it as well, but there was a term that was used, and I can't seem to, I've been looking through different literature and I cannot seem to find it, but it was used, and that talks about both groups that prefer their own sex relationships. And I just don't know. A word in English? Yes. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't being, I wasn't being cute. Um, <laughs> and, I, and it's been used and I just, I can't seem to find it, but I... No, the only things that, that are springing to my mind as you, say, as you asked it immediately are words that were translated from German in the beginning of the 20th century, you know, invert or third sex or, um, or what have you. It may have been, I, I don't know, because uh -oh. I didn't look where the word was originated from, uh -oh. I just, I knew that there was a word for it. And the reason I was looking for that, uh, or being able to, to deal with that, I think that sometimes that word needs to be used, uh -huh. um, because I think a lot of times, but I think the word homosexual is used in a lot of ways that it shouldn't be used, uh -huh. or placed on people that it shouldn't be placed upon. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I think that that word needs to be used so the group can be. Mm -hmm. Well, the one that I really like, uh, because there are, I think now, we're becoming aware of the fact that in different cultural constructs, sexuality is constructed differently. Um, sexual identity or sexual identities are not the same as in um, the dominating culture in the United States, even with cultures within this, this country. Um, and so there, there's a variety of terminology, and I'll talk about that tomorrow when I talk about queer spiritualities. And, and transgressing and transgressing. Um, <laughs> trans, T R A N C E. That's just to throw that out to make the rest of But there is a term that is used historically in the African American community that I find so rich, and that's in the life. Um, and in the life included all kinds of people. I mean, not just what we would define as gay men or bisexual men or lesbians or bisexual women or not. included people, I mean, all people who were in the life, who were living, who were a little bit on the edge. You know, um, people in the arts, people in the theater, commercial sex workers, everybody. And, um, and the, the term life, which has such a, such a vibrance to it, and I, I really start to use that a lot, talking about in the, in the life experience. Mm -hmm. Another term um, I hear it a lot and I, I use as well that I find sometimes very appropriate is, is family. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you heard yeah, of that one? Yeah. Their family? Yeah. I like that one. I would like to thank you for using commercial uh, sex terms. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, see, one thing, if you, if 
you come to know me over time, one thing that I'm um, always very careful about is to not walk into somebody's question that's not my question. Okay? To not walk into a question and try to give it an answer. I have to say that I have to reframe that question. Um, because in the way in which this society is organized, in the way in which the workplace is organized, in the way in which the economy is organized, there is an oligarchy that has control of everything. Now, if I'm a white man and I went to Williams College or Harvard or Yale and I belong to such and such a group and so on and so forth, and then I apply for a job at a big law firm in somewhere, Des Moines, let's say. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to be in my context. <laughs> um, I get an extra push because I'm a white man that went to school with, you know, Bob, who's the vice president of the firm. Now, no one thinks of that as being an extra push, all right? And the way, the whole way that the way things are structured now has come into place through giving advantage and favoring certain people. What I say in response to that is that the, the, the whole way of organizing and structuring the workplace has to be redone, all right? It has to be redone because why? You see, even the fact you still have to give an extra push, that still means that the people on top in control are not the women, not the people of color, not the queer people, all right? And there's only, there is a glass ceiling. You can only go so far if you are one of those things. You can be a token and, and, and make it up through. And as long as who is in control stays in control, that's the way that it's going to be. So I advocate for a complete restructuring of it and a diversity that really reflects it. I mean, why don't you see a lot of uni of women who are heads of universities. You don't see it that often. I mean, it's still even now, disproportionately, women are underrepresented in the academy. And women's um, academic work is not taken as seriously as men's academic work. Now, you might legislate to let in X number of women or X number of people of color in your faculty, but the very, by virtue of the very fact that you legislated in that way indicates that there is something wrong in the system and that just say, okay, we're gonna put one Latina here and one, you know, Jewish woman from India here, because we have a couple categories there with her and you know, let's just throw an issue bisexual on top of it. And then someone else, um, you fall into something that just continues to feed that system. That, that way of working. I mean, and I feel that very strongly because I'm a person who would fall under one of those things, all right? And um, that no matter how brilliant my career has been, no matter how brilliant my education, so on and so forth, there are impediments placed on my being hired because I'm black, because I'm queer, because I'm da 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 da, or all those other things. Right? That I don't have the quality of access. And the people in control, in positions of power, saying that they're going to take a few tokens, that does not create equality of access. I, I really like your idealism. Would that be false to say that you seem to be an idealist? Well, everyone thinks I'm at school, everyone thinks I'm just depressingly cynical. <laughs> 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 Uh, in respect to that, I, I just find you to be idealist. And because of that, um, I think that your freedom on the, uh, on the collegiate level, university level, to come out and be queer is very acceptable. You're not looking for middle school teachers that are saying that they're lesbians. So you, you seem to have that over me. But um, I, I'm very interested in your, uh, you said that rural queers and uh, uh, city queers that join the military is not the right way to go. Where, where's your? Uh, give, give me a good idea. I'm oh no, I, I joining your bandwagon yeah. to what could be alternative. Uh -huh. No, I didn't say that it was not the right way. I said I raised the question, and I raised that question very existentially. I think it's very important to understand 
is where speakers and thinkers come from, all right? That one just don't pull idea out of the air. That's why at the beginning I situated myself very clearly and talked about my experience. And my life partner, who was an African-American gay identified bisexual man who wanted to be an archaeologist who was from, it was a sharecropper son from Durham, North Carolina, was told that if he joined the military, they would send him to Germany and that he could study. And he joined the military because no one in his high school bothered to give him any, any information about how to, go, how to apply to a college and get financial aid. And so he joined the military. Now he was an anarchist and he was an anti-militarist. But he joined the military because that was the only way he thought he could get an education, which he did not get. Because once he got in the military, they didn't give it to him. All right? um, that's why I say that. Why, why are people made to believe that that is an option? And what I would say, um, you know, I'm all for the, the creation of a national um, civil service. I mean, not like a bureaucrat civil service, but um, you know, where you can, for example, you can work for two years, you can work for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force in setting up an office, a fight the right office in, 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 in Iowa. Things like that, grassroots work that could be subsidized. I mean, I know that's a really crazy, <laughs> but you can ask me and I'll just go with it, okay? <laughs> um, but the other thing I want to say also about, um, I think it's really important to understand, again, something about my context, because um, it's true, I am a university professor and I'm out in that context, but there has to be some reason why out of thousands of professors, I'm the only one that's out. All right. I mean, I'm now teaching a white school. Howard University is a black university. Howard University is extremely conservative. Howard University, only in the last 20 years, got a brown skinned black man as president. Because before that, we used to have presidents who could pass for white. Um, Howard University, just now this year, has Oshala, which is the only lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender student organization in any predominantly African-American institution of higher education. I was invited to speak at Morehouse College and the invitation was rescinded because they could not guarantee the safety of my life. So all that is to say that I might say, you know, yeah, you know, he's a professor, he's got dreads, <laughs> and he can you know, do all that. I walk in a landmine and on top of that I teach in a divinity school which, although it's non, did not believe it or not, and they gave me tenure. <laughs> <laughs> the goddess is the foot. <laughs> the goddess is alive, magic is the foot. Um, in the divinity school, it's a non-denominational school, but that is very profoundly, conservatively Christian. All right. Um, so, it's I'm in a very isolated position. I just share very briefly. We have. Uh, a discussion in faculty meeting on sexuality from the biblical perspective. And um, I was very uncomfortable in the discussion, and I shared with my colleagues who are, you no, know, they're liberals. And I hate liberals. I really, <laughs> just liberals make me very nervous. Um, because they're like, well, why are you talking about homophobic? We're not homophobic. You know, I'm in the same way nice white people will say like, well, you know, we're not racist, you're sitting here, we're letting you sit here and talk about <laughs> um, And one of my colleagues had done a presentation talking about how the Hebrew Bible was um, very positive on sexuality. And I was like, okay, now I do read Hebrew, maybe she has a different version than I do. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I said, well, you can only say that if you're saying that heterosexual, procreative, Male sexuality in certain in certain restricted confines relationally can be seen as positive. Then okay, well you know really we could see that. But here I was in a situation where I was hearing other people talk about my issues and what I had to say. They didn't want to take seriously because well you know that's his stuff, so he's obviously not objective. On that, and it's very, you know, it's not a com I'm not in a very comfortable, I'm not in a very comfortable place. What does comfort me in my context is that students have now begun to come out. 
So I have I have good community of queer students within the school because I'm the um, what do you call it the faculty advisor for the <laughs> for the queer student group, and they say, well, you're so crazy. If anything, if we ever do anything, any kind of disability action, we'll just say, oh, he made us do it. <laughs>
And then he asked, well, but what should I do if I want to work in solidarity with people of color? I said, well, you know, what is, he asked, what, is, what was his struggle to be? I said, well, I can't tell you that. I'm not a straight, white, middle class, well-educated man. I don't know that. I know what my struggle is. All I can tell you is what Audre Lord used to say. You have to name your struggle. You have to see what your struggle is. You have to see what work you need to do within your own your own space, you know. But the, the the power thing goes in the same thing in the recognition or the lack of recognition of diversity or the lack of diversity, for example, just in a group, you know. I mean, it's a privilege to be in a group completely of your own and not have to even think that there's something wrong in the picture. I mean, that is a form of privilege because when you're a person of color and you go into a room, you're painfully aware of the fact that you're the only one of your kind, or they're just a handful of you in that space. Power, privilege for me, for example, me recognizing the fact that we have a monolithic concept of culture in this country, <laughs> all right? That there's just generic United States culture. Now, people of color know various forms of white American culture because we have grown up in your houses. We have gone to your schools, we have cleaned for you, we have taken care of you, we have worked for you, we have done all of those things. But most white people don't know our cultures except as they see them portrayed in stereotypical fashions in the, in the media. That's a form of, of power. That's why I'm always very supportive when white students come to, to Howard to study. But I always tell them also that, you know, again, this, this power thing. Well, when you're used to being a white man and just, you know, whenever you want to raise your hand and say something, you just raise your hand and say it. When you're in a black school being taught by a black woman with all black people in the class, and you're the only white boy in there, you get by with that maybe once or twice. And no one even has to call you on it verbally. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a cultural thing. But it's, there's an issue of power and privilege as a white man to subvert the authority of this black woman, all right, in a black context, instead of saying, all right, I need to maybe, in this course, I need to like develop hone my listening skills, you know? <laughs> I would need to learn how to, to be in this kind of setting and here. And some people are very successful at that. And they say it's a very painful process for them, though, because they have, like, you know, in one course, in one semester, they're trying to unlearn a whole life's way of behaving. But it's, that strikes me so poignantly in the, in the classroom, the way that the, the, the dynamic of power and privilege in that sense, and how white students, for example, Another example of a white student who comes to class basically when, at the time when she feels like coming. I mean, she walks into the room when she feels like it, and she has a reputation of getting up. She never finishes a semester, and she just leaves. When she, like, oh, okay, gotta go now. She just gets up and leaves. Well, it's very clear that she has a problem with black people. Unfortunately, I'm not the only teacher who's had this experience with her because I would. Personalized it. But um, I've heard from other colleagues. Now, that to me is a very good example. I know one black student in their right mind would sit in a class in Harvard or Yale or Radcliffe or Vassar and just come waltzing into class 30 minutes late and leave 45 minutes before class ended. I mean, it would never cross our mind to do something like that because we know people think that we come late anyway. We're not smart, you know, we can't pay attention, you know, we're, we're doomed to fail, et cetera, and so forth. I mean, there's a whole set of criteria that inform our behavior in a setting like that, that we, where we have to think about that. And a privilege in our, I don't, you know, I do what I want to do. This is, this is not important enough for me to have to, to focus. And so part of that letting go of that power is recognizing, oh, maybe there is something aberrant in my behavior. 
and something I need to change in my behavior to reflect a consistency with some discourse that I might have. Um, earlier you said something about um, those who deny sexual women being harassed or, and um, abused by gay bashers. Um, personally, I feel like a lot of men's problems with lesbian women is part of that patriarchal ideal that um, men need, women need men uh -huh. to succeed at anything. And I just, I feel like it, it's all on a sexual level. And to go that extra step and to say, I don't need you to get a job, I don't need you to get an education, and I still don't need you for sex, is really what takes it to that mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's what I said, I think. You, you put it in other words, but that's exactly that's exactly, I mean, it's the ultimate threat to this male fantasy 